own basis. No fields, no planes, no artillery bases. And nobody gives a damn. The Tan Peninsula, Philippine Islands, 1942. Scene of a savage three-month battle, one of the largest surrenders of American troops in history, and the Bataan Death March. Like other GIs, Cecil Vandiver marched for days without food or water. His body ached. He wanted to stop and rest. I dropped out on the march. Felt that I couldn't go another inch. And laid down under a big tree. And I was just laying there waiting for the Jap to come along and polish me off. Bill Gentry saw Japanese guards with swords ready to behead American POWs if they fell out of the long column. Bland Moore prayed for salt to help his body cope with the intense heat and fatigue of the march. But we were walking along there and I quit perspiring. And you know, old farm people, they used to have salt, you know, to get them some perspiring. And I tried to get salt and nobody would give you any salt. By that time, the guys were like animals anyway. But you couldn't blame them. Survival. And we was going through this little village and they, the Filipinos were throwing rice balls and things out there. Well, the last thing I wanted was a rice ball. And I was beginning to get dizzy and what have you. And so God be my judge, a little packet landed in his hand right there and opened it up and it was salt. I started eating that salt, started perspiring, and here I am today. And that's almost unbelievable. But it happened. Skip Ruse saw American soldiers bayoneted or shot if they fell out of the column. Such brutality composed the Bataan Death March, yet for a few Kentucky National Guardsmen, this march through fire had many miles and many years to go. Once the march started, we were on the west coast, and so we marched to Marvelous, and then we started the big march. How did Kentucky National Guardsmen become part of the Battle of Bataan, the Bataan Death March? and one of World War II's worst atrocities. Ironically, this journey to hell and back began a half a world away, far from the peace and tranquility of small town Harrodsburg, Kentucky. On the other side of the globe, Japan, a country known for centuries of graceful culture and ancient customs, went on a rampage of war and atrocities unheard of in modern times. Japan's move to conquer northern China and eventual attack on the U.S. gunboat Panay led to an oil embargo by the United States. Japan next planned and executed an attack on the United States at Pearl Harbor. December 7th, 1941, leaving behind a trail of death and destruction, including the lives of over 2,000 servicemen that would forever be remembered as a day that would live in infamy. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. With the American fleet mostly destroyed and no viable opposition in the area, Japan methodically started its unheralded conquest of the Pacific, taking over 300,000 prisoners in the process. The Philippines were attacked, leading to the capture of an estimated 80,000 American and Filipino troops surrendering at Bataan. The march of over 50,000 wounded, sick, and starving soldiers was to be known forever as the Bataan Death March. In 1941, as the United States was preparing for war, 
A National Guard unit from Central Kentucky, the Harrodsburg Tankers, was federalized and sent to be a part of General Douglas MacArthur's army in the Philippine Islands. Prior to this time, the Depression blighted 1930s challenged these Mercer County youths as they looked to the 38th Tank Company for adventure and a little extra money. I grew up in Harrodsburg, and that's where I entered the National Guards. I wanted to join the regular Army, but my dad, he refused to sign the papers. He had to be 21 years old then. I'd been in the National Guards once before in Harrodsburg. And uh, so I got out. I don't know how come to get out. It had too much trouble, I think. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I got back in in uh, June of 1940. The commanding officer for the Harrodsburg uh, National Guard was a cousin of my wife, Bacon Moore. And he told me, he said, Phil, why don't you join the Guard? And that once a month drill, what you get from there will help you. Well, to be quite honest about it, what I got from there paid our house rent. They trained on M2 May West tanks. Learning how to function in the small confines of the tanks and how to maneuver over the rolling Kentucky hills. Back in those days, uh, communications weren't as modern as they are today. So the tank commander sent on a sling that went across the turret and his feet dangled down right at the driver. So our signals were, if you wanted the driver to turn right, you, you kicked him to the right of the neck and to the left. And then uh, if, you, if you wanted him to uh, speed up, you kicked him at intervals. And if you wanted him to stop, you hit him in the back. They trained in upstairs rooms on Harrodsburg's main street, despite adequate lighting, or down on the streets below. Reflecting small town Kentucky, the 38th included many relatives. Several sets of brothers included young men like Morgan and Edward French, Skip and Arch Rue, and Willard and Claude Yeast. They all knew each other and their backgrounds. There was a strong sense of family and a loyalty between them. There wasn't anyone that I couldn't get along with in the, in the unit. Um, they, uh, I can't, I think they was kind of molded together and all felt like a big team. And, okay. and uh, they treated each other as such. However, little did they know how much they would rely on these ties of blood and character in the many trials they would face in the very near future. Active duty to the 38th meant annual training at Fort Knox parades, ceremonies, and security duty at the Kentucky Derby. The Great Flood of 1937 forced the company to guard prisoners at Frankfurt State Penitentiary and moved the inmates to dry ground above the city. There, I know I was in Frankfurt quite a while when we brought the prisoners out from down in the old prison and went up on the hill and the 10th Infantry came down from Fort Thomas and built a uh, tent, the bottom part, frame for perimeter tents, and set up uh, barbed wire entanglements around. Ironically, no one knew they would soon become prisoners themselves. But for the moment, the gloom of a flooded city was broken by the high spirits of the young troops. In 1939, a coal strike in Harlan County brought the 38th into harm's way. Viewing an angry mob through machine gun sights unsettled one of the high school age tankers from Harrodsburg. He wondered if he would actually have to shoot some of the mob participants. They came that close. Our outfit was backed 100% by the people of Mercer County and Harrodsburg. Because anytime there was an emergency like the coal field strikes, we were there keep down, trying to keep down all the problems we possibly could. In the, in the big flood at Frankfurt, 
we were there to uh, help people that was in distress, uh, saving lives. And so we were a good National Guard unit and was used a lot in emergencies, things like that. But America's national security soon overshadowed Kentucky's problem. In 1940, the tank company was enlarged by 62 draftees, redesignated Company D, 192nd Tank Battalion. Company D was then federalized for one year of active duty in the United States Army. The company expected to return to civilian life in a few months. We were inducted into federal service and went to Fort Knox attached to the 1st Armored Division. And we were out on the a new new area there at Knox. I think they called it Roosevelt Ridge. All right. Way out Wilson Road in Fort Knox. The education of the young tankers now began a new phase. First, these country boys felt intimidated by new surroundings. But 30 mile marches, large scale maneuvers, bred confidence into them. They now knew they could get the job done. We enjoyed being down there. Uh, we could come home every weekend just about if we could find somebody to work KP. <laughs> and we really enjoyed Fort Knox. Company D went on to Army-wide maneuvers in Louisiana, which also helped to prove and showcase their abilities. Their unity, cooperation, and spirit stood out during these war games during which they captured enemy headquarters and ended the maneuvers. This success would become very valuable under the real combat conditions they would soon face. Among the observers and judges at the maneuvers was the Army's foremost tank expert, Major General George S. Patton. After his observation of Company D's performance, Patton remarked, the only way to get a tank company to function is to have them all be country boys from the same hometown. This remark was soon to become legendary among the Harrodsburg men. A good percentage of the boys in the uh, National Guard, a lot of them were country boys. And a lot of them were good mechanics. They built up a lot of tanks. These tanks went to, to uh, Louisiana maneuvers. Major General Patton and other evaluators rated the 192nd ready for action and had the report read to the men, stating that the 192nd was one of the finest units that the Army had ever produced. When we got to Louisiana, Patton said we had a top-notch outfit. But with that report also came orders, sending the battalion overseas. This would be another new adventure for the tankers. There were reports that some slept well that night, with others wondering what lay ahead in this faraway land. Before they reached San Francisco, the tankers learned that they were going to the Philippines. We knew that something big was happening, but for this reason, we were due to go to Fort Bragg, North Carolina to finish our maneuvers. And then they stopped it just like that. Gave all of us a chance to go home for a few days that could go home. And uh, then we got back and then they put us, sent us to Frisco. After arriving in San Francisco and eventually Angel Island, the Army's embarkation point for Philippine assignments, the battalion received new tanks and equipment. Another reality check that something big was about to happen. Still, none of the young tankers had any idea that another world war was closing in on them. As they were leaving San Francisco Bay for the Philippines, their ship cruised past Alcatraz Island, site of the infamous prison, Alcatraz. A sailor on board spoke words of warning. I'd rather be here than where you all are going. Not knowing their future, the tankers laughed. Leaving maneuvers and going to the West Coast, not in my wildest imagination were we gonna be, be fighting the Japanese. 
Well, not until we passed that island uh, beyond oh. Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had to pass it in complete blackout. Yeah. And I smelled a mouse there. That uh, there's something up. The strategic Philippines, then a U.S. territory, was receiving shipments of American arms and men for General Douglas MacArthur's large army north of Manila. The tankers fell in, adjusted to the tropical environment, and readied their new M3 Stuart tanks for the war everyone was starting to anticipate more and more. Company D took command of guarding Clark Field. Early on December 8, 1941, Philippine time, news of the attack on Pearl Harbor reached the tankers at Clark Field. Well, we heard about it uh, by radio, uh, about uh, the time it was going on, I guess. Yeah. And uh, of course, we were across the dateline. Yeah, well, that's right, international dateline. At midday, Company D paused for lunch. Looking up, someone yelled, Look at Uncle Sam's Navy planes. Then falling bombs proved this to be wrong. It happened at, at uh, lunchtime. We were, I was on KP, of course. <laughs> I, I was in the mess hall, and we were serving the chow line. And we heard this roaring. And we looked up in the sky, and the prettiest formation you ever seen was coming over, coming right over Clark Field. And we got out and was watching those planes. And the first thing we seen, it looked like stove, sticks of stove wood falling out of the planes. And until they hit the ground, <laughs> we didn't know <laughs> where it was. But we thought it was our own plane thing that always, I'll always remember more than anything else was everything was so peaceful and then all we saw was smoke and dust instead of a peaceful sky because, and then you saw trucks hauling guys with legs running off. I mean, this is, this is something that happened just, a, just like that. And uh, that sudden change then you, then you start being, really being a man. At Clark Field headquarters, the 192nd men watched the runway explode. One of the men shouted, it looks like war is coming. Coming hell, it's here. And we was coming out of the NCO club that day, and I will forget that. Uh, Sergeant Swift, he got his binoculars out and he, looked up and so when he pulled his binoculars out, all of us did. We counted the planes, 54 of them. And uh, he said, well, it looks like we're getting reinforcements. About that time we heard them bombs coming. And uh, then we knew it was authentic. And we started scattering in every direction. I know we were still eating in the PX uh, when the bombing and strafing started and we didn't know what the hell was happening. <laughs> Everybody running every way, and uh, Philippine lavanderos and servants and going everywhere. The surprise attack overpowered most of the anti-aircraft fire and fighter aircraft trying to get off the ground. All Clark Field's bombers were destroyed. The Japanese destroyed 89 airplanes and killed 236 soldiers in the attack. But the 192nd's machine guns on half tracks at the end of the runway, down two enemy fighters. So I, I jumped on that half track, and the, the 50 it had plenty of ammo for that, and 130, it had 230s on it, but I, I only had ammo for one. And uh, I think I was firing both of them things at the same time. And uh, the little dive bombers, they made a figure eight over uh, Clark Field. And all you'd have to do is keep your gun right in one position. Of all the ground forces in the Philippines, only the 192nd tankers extracted a price from the Japanese on that first day of blood. Robert Brooks, a draftee from Sadieville, Kentucky, was Company D's only soldier killed at Clark Field. 
an African-American mistakenly drafted into the 1940s all-white army, he became the war's first armored force casualty. For the rest of Company D, the war and their own lives now entered a new and perilous chapter. The road to Bataan was a hard one, but due to the impending Japanese invasion, MacArthur's army planned a defensive strategy to hold Bataan as long as possible. Right after the bombing, then they set us up north to meet the Japs. And the Japs had already landed Lingang Bay, and that bay was full of Jap boats and what have you. And from that day till it was over, all we did was fight a delayed action deal. Well, we, we, we went north. Yeah, after about a week, we uh, put our uh, vehicles out in the field and uh, our gasoline the same way. And drum after drum after drum, you know, we didn't uh, stack it or nothing like that effect. There, was, there, there weren't. There, there wasn't too much area over there that was adaptable for tanks. That's right. Uh, because uh, you could bury them mighty easy. And of course, uh, normally you only had that one, one oh, highway right. north and south from the yeah. to Baguio. And you'd get off of that and you'd bury a tank. The tanks formed a rear guard, which protected the army and thousands of fleeing civilians. All of the tankers' physical and mental resources were called upon. They went day and night without sleep or rest. In those conditions, they were operating at only about 20%. On Bataan, you got bombed. We went through bombings at least once a week, minimum of once a week. 